good bacteria that actually work for us. And as a matter of fact, even beyond that, help are critical, critical to our health and development, even from the womb. And this is amazing because uh, it's a total change in our whole paradigm, I believe. And it's going to really become more and more prominent as the, year, as the years and decades go, go by in the way we treat uh, patients, whether neurological patients or uh, um, what, you, what you call it now, those chronic diseases, even with cancer. So it's becoming more and more prominent. And we've been using what are known as probiotics, uh, good bacteria to help address uh, disorders such as autism and Down syndrome, genetic disorders, yes, even sickle cell disease, and even in adults, where we, we've seen remarkable changes and improvements, even in things like strokes and, um, and dementia and memory loss. Now, these are not treatments, obviously. These are just things to help in the recovery of these patients. So we felt that it would be fantastic if we had someone who really knows about this come and speak to you all about the whole idea of microbes and their place in human health and, and, and uh, sickness and disease. And we have no, none other than someone I've come, come to respect a great deal, Professor Sarkis Masmanian. Hi, Sarkis. Hello, David. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss this very, very important topic that you just introduced. You know, I think you did a very good job in, in framing the, the change and the shift over the past, I'd say, 10 or 15 years that, at least in the research and scientific community uh, and partially in the medical community, has happened in terms of how we view bacteria and how we view organisms as, again, you know, not these insidious little creatures that only want to make us sick, but ones that potentially can, act, you know, be developed to improve human health. Absolutely. And you've been working in this field for quite a while. Can you just give us a brief background of who you are, what you do, and how you came into this whole, these discoveries that we'll talk about soon? Sure, sure. Uh, I don't like to talk about myself too much, but um, uh, my training, my formal training is in, is in um, microbial pathogenesis. In fact, you mentioned MRSA, which is methicillin resistant staph aureus. My entire thesis, my PhD, which was done at the University of California in Los Angeles at UCLA, was studying Staph aureus and its virulence factors, how this organism causes illness. And this was at the end of you know, the late 1990s, when again, at the time, uh, any self-respecting microbiologist was either studying infectious disease or um, microbial physiology and metabolism, but there really was no active research in trying to understand beneficial organisms. And in fact, um, much of the, the work on the microbiome, uh, uh, had, you know, or, or the, many of the concepts of the microbiome had been developed almost a century ago, um, but had not been, this, you know, researched and investigated with the modern tools and the modern perspectives that we have now. And so as I was finishing my graduate work, um, I became interested in why humans harbor hundreds of trillions of bacteria in their intestines, why we have these organisms and how we tolerate these organisms. And why don't we reject these organisms? Why doesn't our immune system attack these organisms because right. our immune system attacks infectious agents? And that was really the critical question that made me shift my career, um, staying you know, in microbiology, but instead of working on how the immune system controls infections, I began to uh, investigate or at least hypothesize that the immune system itself benefited from these interactions, benefited from interactions with microbes. Um, and so I moved on what to- mean you, That's a huge leap. What made you, forgive me for butting in, but wait, I mean, when, like you said, everybody else was thinking in a different direction. Why would you, I mean, what possessed you <laughs> to, to go in the opposite direction? Uh, Blind faith, uh, I guess, curiosity, curiosity, this this desire for exploration, um, but very little data, right? Because uh, again, at the time, two decades ago, we knew that these organisms existed, right? I mean, again, as I said, you know, the the concept of of the microbiome uh, and its potential impact on human health was proposed by Elie Metchnikoff well over a hundred years ago. And even by Lou Pasteur and, 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 and other prominent microbiologists, 
uh, a century ago, but again, in, in modern times had just not been studied. Um, and to answer your question, uh, my as I started thinking about the trajectory of my career and what I wanted to you know to research and what interested me as I moved towards independence away from, you know at, you know finishing up my training and, and moving towards my own independent career. I love microbes, I love bacteria, so I wanted to stay in that general area. But again, I have this innate desire to, to do things that are different than, than, than tradition, than, than the field itself. And I literally read a one page article about, um, you know, that reminded me about these bacteria. And it was just very, you know, superficial. It just, you know, was a, you know, more of a commercial article than, than a scientific one. And literally within, you know, minutes of reading that article, I thought to myself, this is where I wanted to take my career. Of course, at the time, because you know, the, you know, the the inspiration, the impetus, if you will, was was very was very spontaneous. I didn't know exactly where I wanted to, to go, but I just knew I wanted to study beneficial microbes. Um, and then moved on to to Harvard, where I first tested the hypothesis that the immune system, uh, its development and its function relied on inputs from the microbiome. We were able to make some discoveries. And then just to answer your question about my, my career, um, and then in 2006, moved um, uh, from Harvard to the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, where I've been ever since. And our lab has studied um, how bacteria impact the immune system, the nervous system, and the metabolic system in a number of different contexts. Um, and it's important for me to, to, to mention we're basic researchers. I'm a basic scientist. We work in mouse models or animal models. Uh, uh, of disease, we are. I'm not a clinician. We don't work with humans. Right, right. That, uh, that, well, we, we need you to keep on doing that work so we can we can use it uh, in in our clinical work as well. I mean, your disco discoveries and and those of others have really really helped certainly in my practice and what we're doing to help us to make a difference in the lives of other people. So, absolutely. And and, and, and and that's exactly how we see our role is is to provide potential um, uh, opportunities for clinicians to test some of, some of these discoveries in, um, in human populations of need. Uh, again, we, we just, you know, we develop these technologies and then we, we you know, essentially, you know, through various different mechanisms, uh, release them to the world to be tested in people. Well, well, thank you. We have a few more minutes before the break, but we also, we're going to get into your particular area of interest and the company that you've Founded, if you want to talk, if you are open to talking about that. Sure. Um, so, so the, you know, connected to what I just mentioned about our um, of how uh, information and, and interactions are distributed throughout the body. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you, Sargis, for for for, uh, for highlighting that quarterbacks. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break now. We'll be back with Professor Mazmanian in a few minutes. So don't go away. <laughs> All right, welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Professor, excuse me, Sarkis Masmanian, and we are talking about the effects of microbes upon health, human health as in general. And as I mentioned in the introduction, we were talking about how uh, we are the Brain and Body Foundation. We started, actually, we started really, really with autism, uh, children with autism under the supervision of the federal government of Nigeria. We were treating brain disorders starting with autism. And uh, we began to see the role bugs had to play in them. And so we started looking for my probiotics. Probiotics are beneficial bacteria, which help in, we've had been shown to help in several different areas, as we discussed earlier. And we've got some good ones, and we tried them, and they worked well. And we got some, I would say, beneficial benefits. And you know, when we increased the dose, it even, we got even greater benefits. But there was always something missing. And we started looking and we found out that there were specific microbes that are prominently absent in cases like autism and children on the autism spectrum. And we found out from our guest today, I actually attended one of his lectures, that those microbes were put back somehow into the body. A lot of those autistic symptoms and, and behaviors are shall we say, removed? Yeah, or, or, improved, yeah. or improved, yeah. Or improved, a lot of them, just for one microbe. So I was like, 
where can we get this microbe? And that's how we found a way to reach out to the prof and one thing led to the other. And so here we are. So <laughs> let's talk about Bacteroides fragilis. Yeah, th thank you, David. Um, so uh, as we were doing our research over the years um, and thinking about you know, all these different interactions, but in particular, uh, the gut-brain connection. We wondered whether or not we can essentially access this rich communication between the intestines and the brains through microbes. Um, and so, you know, maybe the first step is, is, you know, I think a lot of this, what I'm about to say is intuitive, but at least I wasn't thinking about it on, on a regular basis, but just how much our, our brain and our intestines actually communicate with each other. So if we think about our senses, Right, you know, sight, smell, hearing, taste, and, and touch, our visceral senses. I mean, these are all inputs into the brain. And the brain uses those inputs not just to sense the environment, but to make decisions. But I would argue the largest molecular input to the brain is through the gut, right? So in terms of actual molecules that enter our body, our digestive system evolved just for this reason, right? Is, is obviously to bring in nutrients to, to nourish our, our bodies, but also brings in a rich chemical library of molecules that circulate throughout our entire body and into our brain. And so uh, again, many, many uh, molecules that are found throughout our bodies, including our brain, are products from bacteria, uh, generally dietary products that, you know, uh, that were uh, uh, metabolized or produced by bacteria are what we absorb. In fact, I've read studies that say somewhere along the lines of 90% of the molecules that we inject, that we that entered into our body were first metabolized by bacteria, right? And so essentially bacteria alter what we eat and then we eat their byproducts. And so this, this, this you know, really was fascinating to me to think to, to, that there are so many, you know, that there's such a huge impact of, you know, of the intestines on outcomes that are regulated by the brain, whether that's uh, behaviors, whether that's um, uh, neurodegeneration, whether that, that's you know, decision-making memory and cognition. And so that, that was the initial insight, right? It was to, was to think about using bacteria to essentially access this highway between, between the gut and the brain. And so again, you know, as I mentioned, our work is in mouse models and we initially used uh, mouse models of autism to test these hypotheses. And in theory, it could have been other, other uh, uh, disease indications, models, let's say schizophrenia or depression where we could have started. Um, the reason why we started with autism was uh, very logistic as we had a very good collaborator at Caltech who had, uh, act, had developed mouse models of autism. And so we had access to them. And, and so there, there, there's a, you know, you know, a, a logistical component to it. But of course, there's a scientific and, and, and health component to it is that uh, about half of the, the autistic population have some form of GI issues. So many children with autism, which is a behavioral disorder, um, have constipation or diarrhea or abdominal cramps and bloating. Uh, that have been reported. Again, a lot of this is anecdotal. There, there are several um, uh, uh, clinical studies now that, that validate this. So again, there was a, 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 a medical rationale for, for thinking of, of using autism to test our hypotheses. And so um, we, uh, through a series of studies, showed that in this mouse model of autism, there was a depletion of particular microbes. And this was, you know, obviously interesting to us because it, what, what it does, it creates an opportunity to test a, a concept that maybe the absence of bacteria is a risk factor for disease. So again, this connects to what we had just discussed a few minutes ago, right? Is that, you know, bacteria aren't always bad. So if you're, you, know, if you have good bacteria and if you're missing a good bacteria, then the absence of that good bacteria is your risk for, for developing a disease. Yeah. And so then that creates the opportunity that I just mentioned of now supplementing. And as David uh, alluded to as well, of a restoring what would be, let's say a healthy microbiome by, uh, by administering particular bacteria. And so we use bacteria fragilis uh, for various different uh, reasons is that it had both immunologic properties and it had GI restorative properties that were very attractive to us. Um, and so as I mentioned in autism, which 
was also reproduced in the mouse model that there were GI symptoms. So these mice had features of constipation and they also had barrier defects, which some may call leaky gut, but essentially the intestine was absorbing things that it wasn't supposed to absorb. So even toxic molecules, which in a healthy gut are excluded, were being you know, you know, found in the circulation of the animals. So our hypothesis was that if we apparently, if we potentially repaired the, the gastrointestinal systems, if we made the, the, the intestines work better, would we then see benefits in terms of behavior? In fact, we did. So we treated the animals with bacteria fragilis, which again, our prior work had shown, had uh, the ability to improve gastrointestinal function. And not only did it improve gastrointestinal function in the animals, but it improved almost all of their behavioral uh, 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 abnormalities or their uh, behavioral deviations as well. And so autism itself is diagnosed uh, by deficits in, in social communication, which includes both verbal and, and physical communication, as well as repetitive behavior. The, these features can be modeled in mice. So mice don't get autism. Autism is a human quality. Um, but the, you know, mice socialize, so they socialize differently if they have features of autism or they communicate differently than, than, a, than a control animal. And so what we were able to show in, in this mouse model is that bacteria fragilis improved communication and improved anxiety, it improved some of the sensory issues and improved, improved the repetitive behaviors that these mice were, were exhibiting which again, I think speaks to the fact that it has this broad activity, not that it's you know, sending one, and what I'm about to say is, is, is my, my opinion, it's, uh, we have no data one way or another, but that it's not as if the organism was you know, sending specific chemical signals to one neuron in the brain that controlled repetitive behavior, another neuron that controlled vocalization, but it had these more broad you know, physiological effects on the animal which again, we trace back to its improvements in, in GI function. And so that's how we initially uh, validated and ultimately published in 2013 that bacteria fragilis, at least in the mouse model, had very broad effects in improving altered behaviors. That is, that is amazing. That is one single bacterium. I mean, it's, that, that's, that's bizarre. And I understand, if I understand this correctly, you were at first ridiculed for coming out with Oh, there was a lot of kickback. Well, you know, there's, there's always skepticism, right? When, when you know, uh, there are advances that's, that's, you know, aren't traditional, that aren't, you know, linear in terms of thinking, right? right? Um, and so what I mean by linear is, you know, our research wasn't the, you know, 50th step in, in a research project. It, it was the first step in, in this discovery. And so, you know, when, you know, there, whenever there's sort of this disruptive technology, you know, I think it's very healthy to be skeptical, right? Because th there, there are a lot of, you know, discoveries, there are a lot of claims that, that ultimately aren't validated. And so if we just pursued every potential, you know, uh, exciting discovery, then I think we, we'd be on the wrong track a lot. And so, you know, the concept that one can treat brain disorders via the gut via bacteria 10 years ago or eight or nine years ago, the fact that it was met with skepticism, I think is natural. I think that that's, that, that's you know, the scientific system to not allow every, again, every you know, you know, claim to, to just be you know, you know, believed to be fact. But you know, ultimately what happens is that if in fact that disruptive technology that, that, that discovery has scientific merit, then it will be validated by others. It will be reproduced by, by other groups by, or by other organizations. And then ultimately developed to where we have both more understanding of how that system works. So if you, you, know, you described it, you know, if I do A, then B happens. Well, the question was, well, then how does that happen, right? So if you start filling in the gaps, right? That builds more evidence, more credibility for that discovery because now there's substance in understanding how that happens. But ultimately, um, you know, we want to test this, th th these concepts in people because, you know, I think to me, that is the, the, the best way to validate uh, initial biomedical research is to show that in, you know, a very different context in, in humans, 
that you're able to, to, to you know, essentially reproduce the findings from, from the preclinical mouse studies. Um, and so now, I, you know, I, I think we're, we're well on our way to um, getting an answer. We don't have that answer yet, but we're well on our way to getting the answer of whether this organism um, and the mechanisms and biological mechanisms used by this organism may be effective for treating autism um, based on, on human trials. And so as David has mentioned uh, to your audience and has interviewed uh, uh, Stu Campbell from Axial, uh, we have, uh, uh, I co-founded a company to do just that, was to take this technology from our academic laboratory where we don't do human research uh, and to now develop it and test it in the context of human trials and autism uh, and uh, Axel has completed an initial trial uh, in autism where with you know technologies uh, that I'm discussing where the results were, were quite positive and quite encouraging. And even then the first human trial isn't, doesn't mean that you've, you've made the, the ultimate discovery. It doesn't mean you've solved the problem. You've now embarked on a new road, a new journey, right? But now entirely in humans to ultimately reach what would be our objective or our goal of getting an approved therapeutic for behavioral disorders such as autism. And I can't wait for that. So I guess I honestly can't wait. I'm like, when, when can we get this thing? I mean, what's, what's the delay, right? And of course, like I said, we have lots of people who would love to be a part of the study. So if we can make it happen, uh, I'm, we're all in, we're all in. So, so we're watching very, very closely and how this thing goes. We have a few minutes, uh, at least, well, I'm sorry, we have about two minutes left before the, the end of the show. Uh, but I definitely want to hear, do you have any final, final you want to leave our audience with? Well, at the end of the day, you know, there are many ways to treat symptoms uh, or treat disorders once they've manifested. Um, uh, and many of, you know, and we do the, in, in biomedical research, we do this, but there are many, many disorders, many conditions. It doesn't even have to be a disease, right? So if you're lethargic or, you know, you're having a, you know, a concentration of memory issues that aren't, it's not a disease, you know, it's not a disorder, right? But it, 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 it affects your quality of life, it affects your, your, your daily activities. Um, yeah. You know, that, 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 you know, those, uh, you know, conditions are, are, are being addressed, but those are more, you know, these are very challenging, you know, but you know, maybe the final thought, thought would be is that as we understand more from, you know, you know these, these types of, of research questions, uh, one of the, the themes that always keeps coming back to us is that ultimately the effects of microbes are dependent on the nutritional and biological state of microbes. So in other words, if a microbe is going to have a therapeutic effect on a human, as a concept, that microbe itself should be healthy. And how do microbes, how are microbes healthy is if they are getting the nutrients that they need for their proper physiology. All this is a long way, David, of saying that a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle ultimately, you know, you know, has, has huge impacts on health but, and those impacts may be through, uh, largely through the microbiome as well. And so until we get to the point where we understand enough about biology, enough about human physiology to be able to, you know, give a treatment in a bottle, you know, I think we can make a lot of gains in the interim just by living very, very healthy lifestyles. And so what I just said is obvious and is intuitive, but sometimes I need to remind myself as well that I can get a lot of benefits, not from prescription drugs, but just from eating healthy foods. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. But then there are also others who cannot recover from their illness and disease without some kind of intervention or help. <laughs> so the healthy lifestyles are extremely important. I'm really, really impressed upon people. Also, we also need help from time to time, which, which is why we're so happy for, um, grateful for what you're doing and people like you who are doing this kind of work. And uh, anything we can do to help push it forward please let us know i appreciate it Sergeant. god bless and thank you again well thank you folks uh, for joining us remember these videos are available on our site and on the nta website as well so stay tuned stay safe and uh, keep on living a healthy lifestyle god bless see you next week
Information is power. Everyone wants power. So feel powerful with the NTA News Mobile app, the one stop information center. Real news at your fingertip. Be the first to report by uploading first hand information on the U Report link. And be the first to know by simply clicking on any of the links on the sidebar for headlines, domestic and foreign news, economy, security, politics, sports, and more. Stream live on your smartphone and tablets and stay connected. It's pretty easy. Simply download NTA News app from your Google Play Store and you're good.